those again. The word is that this generation, okay, and this generation I mean everyone that is in the room living in this time now, not specifically the youth but speaking to the youth, the generation, that God wants to use them as he used to the, the generation of Joshua. And we're going to be speaking about the generation of Joshua today. Joshua was one of the greatest military leaders of all times. If you study the structure, if you study what happened in that time, you will be surprised on how he was a conqueror. God had promised the promised land, Canaan, to Israel. But Joshua was the one who actually stood up and was the one leading that generation to victory, to sitting where God had placed, wanted to place them to be. For us to understand the story and the generation of Joshua, we need to understand the concept and the context behind this generation. The context is that Israel was enslaved for over 40 years. And then God sent Moses. And we all know about the ten plagues. We all know about God opening the Red Sea and leading Israel out of being Slaves, of being servants, of being not worthy, of being, you know, a nation that wasn't actually a nation. They were just an add-on to Egypt as servants. And God takes them straight into the desert. As, as God takes them straight into the desert, 14 days after they crossed the Red Sea, 14 days, they get to the borders of the promised land. And then they send, Moses gets 12 princes of Israel, 12 leaders, young people of the tribes, and say, listen, guys, go. Go check that out. And come back and give me a report. And 12 of them went. Can you remember the names of the 12? No, neither can I. But you can remember the name of two, I'm sure. Because ten of them came back saying, Moses, there is big fruits there. There's a lot of meat. There's iron. There's everything that we need to be a big, big and powerful nation. But there's one thing. There are giants. People that have never been defeated. They are taller than my friend Mark right here. It's like really big guys, three meters, three and a half, four meters, skilled in fight. And this generation of slaves could not see themselves as victorious. They could only see the challenges. They could only see the defeat. They could only see that they could not make it. Because in fact, if it wasn't for God's miracles, they would have still be enslaved. That had only been 14 days. Joshua and Caleb, those two, I'm sure you know their names, came back with a different thing. They came back saying, hey guys, stop with this. Seriously. You're saying we can't. And you might be right. We can't do that on our own. We can't do that on our strength. But we know our Lord. He is capable. He has done it. And he is going to give us our enemies into our hands. But then they were two against ten. And those ten shushed Joshua and Caleb. And told the whole congregation, let's go back to Egypt. We might find better luck than fighting these giants. They were willing to become slave, enslaved again 
out of fear, lack of confidence in both themselves and in God. And because of that, God spoke to Moses and said, this generation that came out of Egypt will not enter the promised land. And that was the very reason why Israel wandered for 40 years in the desert. Because they did not trust the Lord who had spoken to them that he would do so. So that generation wandered for 40 years, but Joshua and Caleb, those two stayed. And that's the story, that's the first appearance that we see Joshua. He's the guy that is saying, the Lord will give us. The Lord will do this. And he had this powerful faith that wasn't enough to convince the congregation of Israel. And we know this story around the desert where God made many things. God did many miracles. God gave them water. And that generation was kind of you know, complaining. Can't you agree with me? I don't know how many of you have read through Exodus and Numbers. I know it's not a very popular book, but here is what it is saying there. They were complaining. Moses, there's no water. We're going to die of thirst. We're going to die thirsty. Where is the water? And they would complain and they would say, we better go back to Egypt. At least we had water there. And Moses would go, poor Moses, you know, annoyed, and he would go and pray, and God would come and perform a miracle. There was a time that I believe if it was South African people that was there in that place, or Brazilian people, we would have done the same. No way. The people of Israel started complaining. There's no meat. We want to eat meat. We want to braai. I mean, a few of you that know me, you guys know, Matthew knows, you know, I like my meat. I had the lovely bride the other day, and you guys also love your meat. We want to eat meat, so the people of Israel came to Moses and said, Moses, can we bry? We need to bry, we need meat. But they were complaining, 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 and there was this tiresome task that Moses had that one day he got so annoyed because there wasn't water again, and God told him, just touch the rock, and I will give you water. He didn't touch it, and I kind of relate with his frustration sometimes. He hit the rock a couple of times, and water came down, and God said, because you did that, and you did not show the congregation that the water was coming from me and not from you, you're not going to enter in the promised land. In fact, there were a couple of times that God said, I'm going to leave you guys, seriously. I can't come with you because, man, who can come? I mean, parents of teenagers. Teenagers do not complain at all, right? (laughs) Right, guys? You don't complain. Liku, do you complain? No. Mm -mm. I know that. I know. Youth is being powerful. We've been teaching you to don't complain. Just a little bit. Complaining. God said, hey, no, man. And then Moses said, okay, I'm not going to go anywhere without you, but you need to show me then who's going to go into the promised land. Who's going to lead these people? And God shows Moses the young Joshua. Young at that time, 40 years old as he came into the desert. Still young like me. I'm 37, so three years to go. But do you know what age was Joshua when he entered the promised land, when he started leading? Anyone knows? 80 years old. 80. 80. And from 80 years old on, he became the greatest military leader of his time. He conquered 31 nations including the giants, 31 nations, 31 kings. 
But there is one thing about Joshua in the very beginning of his life that shows the very source and the very inside-out faith that he had. And I want to invite you to open your Bible in Exodus 33, verse 7, the second book of the Bible. Exodus 33, verse 7. It says there, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of the meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance of their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Guys, this speaks so much about Joshua. It speaks so much about the hunger he had in his heart to seek God's presence, to seek the presence of the living God, to be in the presence of the living God. Here it says that Moses, God spoke to Moses face to face as he spoke to a friend. And every time Moses would stand up and go to the tent, here comes Joshua. I'm not missing this out. And he goes with. And he stays there. And he's there involved in the same glory, in the same presence inside of that tent. And Moses speaks to God. And Moses was a man that really searched for God's presence. He even once stayed for 40 days and 40 nights in his presence, without eating. How crazy is that? Joshua, when Moses stood up and left, he would stay. He would stay. And this characteristic is a characteristic of every single man of God in the Bible, but very particularly of the ones who were conquerors, of the ones who were used in military, of the ones who would overcome battles. We can remember King David that said that a thousand days, one day is better than a thousand days. One day in the house of the Lord is better than a thousand days outside. The King David that did everything he could, even before himself having a house, to bring the Ark of the Covenant of God into Jerusalem because the Ark represented God's presence. And the Ark had been forgotten for many, many years. Over a hundred years, people wouldn't seek God's presence in Israel. And the first thing that King David wanted is his presence. His presence. His presence. I want him. I want him first. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul as well, where in Philippians chapter 3, from verse 7 on, he says, I consider everything as nothing in my life, so that I can know Him. I can experience His power and His suffering. I want to be doing what He is doing. I want to be where He is. But above all, I want to experience the reality of a God who speaks to you, who transforms you. And so was Joshua, seeking God's face, seeking His presence. He wanted Him above all things. He enjoyed His presence. If you draw the difference between Joshua and the generation of other people who were around him, you can see it very clear in the text. Were, they, were they, they in the tent with Joshua? Where were they? 
in their houses, in their own tents. They would be pay the due res respect. But that was all. There was a distance. And that distance had been coming for very long. Because when Moses went up to the mountain and God spoke and there was fire and everything, God said, I want to speak to the generation, to the congregation of Israel. And they said, no, we don't want to hear God's voice. We don't want to see him. Moses, God speaks to you. It's your job. Do it. And isn't there a sadness in that? where the God who called each and every one of us for a close relationship with him, where we would find out who he is and experience his power, his love, and his grace. Isn't it sad that this generation just said, you know, appoint a man, and this man can speak for us. And all that they had from God was from someone else. And they wonder why they rebelled. I wonder why they were all after their own business the whole time. I wonder why they were all complaining the whole time. I wonder why their mindset was still of enslaved people that could never be a mindset of conquerors, of world changers. Do you know why? Because he didn't see, they didn't see the one who can do that face to face. It is so easy to just come and pay our respect. It's easy to just come and raise our hands, but inside of our hearts there, are, there is no desire. And I'm not saying that to condemn you. No, I'm saying that to myself as well. There is an inborn desire that God wants us to have. And he said that in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they will be full. For righteousness means everything that comes from God. And Joshua had this thing going. The first picture we see of him is this. Then we will see Joshua again in the desert when Moses is on the top of the mountain and people are holding Moses' hands. Who is the one com in the co in commanding the army? It is Joshua. He's a fighter. He's there fighting. He's there on the field. Sorry for the comparison, but there is blood in his hand. He's not leaving it to anyone to do anything for himself. But he himself is putting his hands into his own destiny and allowing God to lead him into the, what God wants him to do. And he's there and he's overcoming. As we already said, he went into Canaan and came back with faith. Faith inspired, inspired life reflecting the quiet time in the presence of God. Then he is appointed. And God says to him, Joshua, don't be afraid. Be courageous. Now imagine now God looking at you in the middle of your battles, in the middle of your challenges, in the middle of your life, in the middle of a country where a lot of people are complaining and running away and going to better places. And imagine God looking at you and pointing at you and saying, brother, sister, be courageous. I have appointed you and I am with you. And here is the thing. From the presence of God, God starts changing our mindset from enslaved and complaining people to conquerors. And here is the first thing that you need to know so that your mindset will change, that you are chosen. The second one is that you are loved. 
The third one is that He is with you. And the fourth one we will go into here now. But He is with you. Isn't that what Jesus said? I am with you all days. I am taking care of everything. It's not a thing about performance. It's not a thing about you standing up and now saying, Cha! I'm going to fight everything. It's not only about that. It's about Jesus is going in front of you. And that's exactly what Joshua does next. He goes on and he calls on to the congregation and says, Hey guys, stand up. We're crossing the river. We're doing this. And the first thing that he calls on is for people to fast and pray for three days. Then they get the ark of the presence of God. And as they walk in front, the, the presence goes in front. The Jordan River stops. The flow of the river stops. And they can cross the whole river. Walking through it without getting wet. Imagine the scene. Imagine the power. Imagine God coming through in such a way. And they cross the river. And they put up 12 stones as testimony. So people would know that really happened. They got the stones from the bottom of the river. And they walked in. As they walk in, something else happens. Joshua is reminded that people are not under God's covenant. So he calls everyone to covenant with God. And every male is circumcised. And they are aligned with what God wants them to do. And as they prepare to go and attack Jericho, something else happens. As he's walking, as he's looking, he sees on the top of the mountain a warrior with a sword drawn in his hand. And it's a powerful warrior. It's a majestic warrior to the point that the very leader of the camp, the very leader of the congregation walks up to that man that is alone and looking at them and says, are you for us? Were you against us? Are you one of the giants that they, they said? What are you? And the man turns to him. And I have, <laughs> my hair is off. <laughs> turns to him and said, I am the Lord of the armies. I am Jehovah Sabaoth. The Lord of the angel armies. The one who leads the one who is in front. And as Joshua, the greatest military leader of his time, sees the Lord as a warrior. In his presence, his identity is confirmed because God had called him to be a warrior. God had called him and God is showing him, I am the greatest warrior. Look at me. Follow me. I am in front of you. It's like Peter, when Peter sees who Jesus is and he points to Jesus and says, you are the Christ. And Jesus turns to him and says, you are Peter. At that moment, Peter wasn't Peter. Peter was Simon. That meant very, with a big lack of constancy, he would go with the wind. That's what Simon means. And Jesus said, you are a rock. You are a rock, Peter. Was Peter a rock at that time? No. He denied Jesus. He was inconstant. But Jesus called him by his spiritual identity. And as Joshua is in, the fr in front of God, in his presence, he sees his identity. And he is renewed and filled with power. His mind does not reflect anymore the mind of an enslaved per person or an enslaved nation, but he see the one who created the world leading him. And he submits to him. He bows down. And that is the fourth thing that you need to know. You're chosen. You're loved. 
What was the third thing? I forgot. Sorry? God is with you. Thank you. Someone is listening. <laughs> he submits everything. Everything. His life is not his own. His life is not his own. He will follow Jesus wherever he goes and he will do whatever he does. And he will be passionate for whatever Jesus wants him to be. As Isaiah had a vision of God, he first saw his iniquity. And when he was purified, the first thing that he said is that, Lord, I'm here. Send me. Send me. In total submission. But not to conquer what we want, but to conquer what God wants us to conquer. His dreams for us. To live out his identity in our lives. And how great that is. How great that is. There is a third, there is a, there's a point here. It's not the third, I lost my points, but there is another thing here that's very, very important. Out of God's presence, he transformed an enslaved man in a conqueror. He transformed a man that lived in the desert in the biggest king of, of all. He gave this man a supernatural faith. And this is what this generation has to draw from the Lord. A supernatural faith. To not be complaining, where are the things? I can't see. To start living in the natural the whole time and being affected by the natural the whole time. But he starts seeing as the eagle sees from top Start sings as the Lord sees. There's a thing. The word praise in Hebrew. When you, you st study the root of it, I don't have all the details now, but the word praise is something that will help you to see further as well as to see Him. When we praise the Lord, when we worship Him, we don't increase Him, but we increase our awareness of Him. As, as we increase our awareness of Him, the picture changes because we don't see anymore as the world sees, but we see as He sees. We see Him saying, be courageous. We see him saying, I love you. We see him saying, I am with you. We see him saying, I will prepare you. I will give you the dreams of my heart. I will change your heart, your mind, your whole being. I will make you a conqueror. Imagine that scene. The Lord of the army going in front of you for the battle. You can imagine because that's what the Bible tells us so. It's not our fight. Our fight is not against flesh or blood. They're in the spiritual realms, but the Lord has given us His armor and He Himself is in front of us. Conquerors. Not on our own, but depending on Him. Trusting Him for everything. But here is the thing that most people fail at. And the generation of Israel with Moses failed at so badly. They kept distance. They never put their hands in. They never sought the Lord with their entire hearts, as Jeremiah says. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me wholeheartedly. For our lack of desire, for our lack of desire for him, we are not transformed and we do not become agents, agents of transformation. 
God wants to give birth to a new nation. How many of you could say amen to that? God wants to give birth to a new nation. God wants to give birth to your family in Him. God wants to give birth to His things, to His kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done as it is in heaven. That's what we prayed here, but this is the reality. How will that come? How will that come? And believe me, it's not you that's going to make it. But you can make a difference. If you enlist yourself and seek God's presence above all things, because He will transform you, and you will see Him fighting every battle, and you will feel Him along the way every day. So you have a chance to stay and pay your respect, or to seek Him entirely. And that's the call of the Lord for your life today. To seek His presence wholeheartedly. To submit, even deny your own life for His life in you, in you, in your family. And from that, you will draw supernatural faith to walk as a heavenly agent in this world that will change that will bring God's kingdom on earth. You can be the complaining person, or you can be the conqueror. And God is calling us, come, come all that are weary and heavy laden. Come, rest in me. Take upon you Take upon you what is mine. Take upon you. I will carry you. This is all there. And this is all real. Because God is real. And I pray over our country. I pray over this generation that we will raise as Joshua. As conquerors. Amen. I just want to pray. I think the worship team can come back, but I just want to pray. Father, I just want to ask you to draw our lives back to you. To draw our lives to the secret place. To draw our lives to your heart to draw our lives and our hearts to seek you wholeheartedly, to close the door of our room, Lord, and submit everything and give our whole life to you, Lord, as you transform us, as you use us, Lord, as you speak to us as you continue to speak to us from your presence, Lord, from your presence, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.